All right, today's a fun one because today I'm finally doing another indie game spotlight video, which is by far my favorite series on the channel. Fun fact, these are also the most consistently high rated videos that I produce, so probably a lesson in there somewhere. But regardless, whenever I find an exceptional indie game, the kind that makes me lose track of time or stay up later than I otherwise should be, I try to put together a spotlight for it because considering all the problems and drawbacks of modern AAA titles, indie games are the logical solution to all of that. And good indie games are, in my opinion, the future of gaming. Before diving in, the game itself is called Manor Lords. And I have to be clear here, this isn't an actual full review. It honestly can't be an actual review because I'm not even playing the fully released product yet. I'm playing a press build that the publisher sent me. But also, the review embargo hasn't been lifted yet. So I'm not trying to burn a bridge here with what I consider to be one of the industry's up and coming best publishers. And I mean that quite literally. See, I know about Hooded Horse because I'm friends with the developer behind Falling Frontier, which is also one of the games under their publisher umbrella, and I've had the pleasure of getting to know how they operate over the past couple of years while checking out multiple of the games that they support. Another one being Nebulous Fleet Command, which is also an indie spotlight in the series. Everyone complains right now about the greedy practices and lack of forward-thinking innovation displayed by major publishers, Ubisoft, EA, Take-Two, etc., etc. But hear me when I say this, Hooded Horse is like the perfect antidote to all of that. These guys are doing it right. They pick winners, they support relatively obscure but wildly deserving indie titles, they treat their devs amazingly well, and they bring value to gaming in a way that you just don't see or get really from bigger names right now, making it very easy to not only recommend Manor Lords, obviously that's what the whole video is about, but also the entire Hooded Horse game catalog because it is consistently filled with quality products. In a world where people are turning more and more towards up-and-coming non-mainstream titles to find creativity and passion, I wanted to start the video by saying that because it's not just about the individual games, it's also about the infrastructure to support them. And that's precisely what Hooded Horse has already become. Infrastructure to support awesome indie games. Oh, and it's one of the most wishlisted titles in all of Steam history, Manor Lords is. That's probably worth mentioning as well. With all of that said, let's dive in. Manor Lords is a real-time strategy city builder with emphasis on historical accuracy, large-scale tactical battles, and it's made, believe it or not, by a developer called Slavic Magic, which is one person. The basic purpose is to rule your kingdom, trade resources, raise armies, claim territory, build more towns, rinse, repeat again and again. But for that kind of gameplay loop, you have to be engaged. Manor Lords has fantastic levels of engagement at pretty much every single bracket of town development, which was genuinely surprising to me since I assumed that this would end up being one of those kind of build up, churn out armies, play a macro battle simulator type games. It's definitely not that. It could be that way if you want it to be, but the process by which you grow your town is actually extremely flexible, and once you establish yourself, the details of how you manage that economy shift from detailed management of population and resources to macro management of resource exports, which then heavily rewards whatever further efforts you want to make developing more towns. The background right now is some mid to end level gameplay from my second run, where I upgraded pretty much everything you can, established a strong home region, and now I can build up the others relatively easily, as much as I feel like doing. But the flexibility here is what matters because thanks to some very creative gameplay choices, you end up having a much more comfortable experience when compared to similar RTS titles. I'm not going to bore everyone with like a 15 minute video about how there's iron in the game and you can mine it and then you make weapons because yeah, obviously. You can trade, export, import, you can farm, rotate crops, increasing yields for subsequent variations by refertilizing the soil, which is a super cool mechanic by the way. Customize building plots, fields, entertainment, marketplaces etc, etc. But any comprehensive RTS game should have all of that stuff. What matters is how Manor Lords decided to structure the economic functions and how population is tied into a family system. See, Manor Lords is built on the concept of families, where a worker unit is actually multiple people. You assign a family to work at a building, and then the family produces or refines or whatever it may be for that particular job, with multiple individual people involved in it which lets you bridge the gap from tedious in terms of overcomplicating the prospect of city management, which far too many RTS games unfortunately do, all the way to fluid and smooth while increasing the relative scale of the game dramatically. It's this like perfect middle ground where you certainly have to make tons of impactful decisions all the time, what crops to grow, when to harvest berries instead of hunting for meat to allow herd regeneration, or how to perfect the flow of resources into and out of granaries or stockpiles with the right number of workers right into the market, which is, I'll get to the market in a second because it's really cool. But you don't have to sit there devoting time to things that feel useless or tedious, especially at the later stages of the game. 
Frankly, it's incredible. The bigger your city gets, unless you make some really backwards and poorly thought out decisions, which I did on my first run, so, I mean, it happens, the easier it is for you to let the city float on autopilot, kind of, as you spread your time between other areas. However, as true as that can be, if you do decide to focus on that larger city again, you are heavily rewarded for optimizing the workflow, and you'll see enormous benefits from rearranging the population, retasking a few of the families to get better jobs, or otherwise micromanaging the production lines. This is slightly embarrassing to admit publicly, but for the longest time on my first run, the city felt like it was moving in slow motion. People weren't working. Logs weren't getting refined into planks, meaning I couldn't build buildings. Basically nothing was happening except in short little bursts of activity once in a while. And the city was stable-ish, kind of, but it wasn't thriving. Well, come to find out, this was because I only had one oxen in the entire town, and once I remedied this problem by building more stable space, trading for some more oxen, evenly distributing some of them to dedicated buildings, the city absolutely came to life and started buzzing with activity in a completely new way, because the resources needed to complete tasks would actually get to where they were needed almost instantly. Just to expand on that a little bit, having a family with no actual assigned profession or job lets them lead the ox around town pulling things where they need to be, which was a function I didn't fully understand at first. So trust me when I say this, I'm going to have so many different tips and tricks for this game when it launches, which is at the end of the month, by the way. Another thing that really stood out was the marketplace, as I said before. The marketplace is like a beating heart in your city, because that's where everything gets distributed to the homes, which is necessary for upgrades. It's a pretty simple system, once you understand it, where the closest houses get first pick and thus are able to be upgraded faster. But once again, simplicity does not have a negative connotation here, because even the most simplistic design elements, when used properly, can create a complex, engaging system of gameplay. For the market, continuing with that example, it's a pretty direct relationship. If there's a vendor with, let's say, 10 pieces of clothing, the closest 10 homes will have the clothing requirement fulfilled, which is one of the necessary things for them to continue upgrading. But having that sort of market distribution system for practically every single resource in the game makes the city come alive as family members are always running place to place, collecting, selling, distributing, and refining materials. This game, to use that word again, feels alive. Sure, you can pause it, which you'll be wanting to do a lot as you learn how it works initially, or speed time up, which you'll be doing a lot during certain combat encounters, probably. But even with total control of the actual real-time pacing, the city still feels like it's bustling with activity independent from any decision that you make, which is a really good atmosphere for a game like this to have. Meshing into that atmosphere, your army, is your literal people. It's not a spam fest where you just raise armies out of thin air because you happen to have the weapons or the money, even though you, you can hire mercenaries, but they arrive in certain places and it's not really comparable. Far from it, actually. In Manor Lords, when you raise an army, your people actually collect the weapons stored in their homes and go out to fight in the field, leaving from whatever they were doing at the time as their job, which again builds up an atmosphere of importance. Not tedium, I keep saying that because it matters, importance, where the decisions you're making consistently have impact without actually holding you back and forcing you to engage with a particular aspect of the game more than you want to. Immersive, that's the word of the day for this game, because everything you do, hear, and see actually makes sense for what a feudal lord could know and realistically govern. That sounds weird, but let me put it this way. As a lord, would you really be micromanaging every single small function of an entire city? like who takes what to the market and how many items they have that day and bring? Or would you be making bigger decisions about where the roads go and how many families are devoted to that particular farm, while small things are left to the actual villagers? That's a rhetorical question, because obviously no actual medieval lord could govern that intricate level of behavior by citizens, but games often let you do it because they don't have adequate systems to compensate for your decision making. Well, that's not the case here. And Manor Lords absolutely does have adequate systems to compensate, leaving you with the ability to walk around your city physically as a lord, make realistic and immersive decisions about how it functions, without ever being stuffed into a corner, frantically making tiny little changes because the production flow is broken, since a resource isn't getting to where it needs to be, and the entire metaphorical machine stopped working. Funny story, that actually did kind of happen to me, where a particular resource wasn't getting to where it needed to go. In this case, it was malt, never getting converted to ale, so I couldn't fulfill the entertainment requirement for housing and upgrade my burgage plots. But owing to the flexibility that already exists in the game, I just set up a trade route and purchased all of it. I was able to continue on like nothing happened. I threw in some extra items to export and compensate for the relative cost, 
letting me get back to the fun side of the game despite an issue that could have easily derailed my entire experience in a different title. There's more I could say. I could talk about the upgrade tree and how some of the upgrades are mathematically way stronger than the others or more valuable or better to take early on. But that's the kind of thing I'll say for the actual review and for the tips video I'm already actively working on and making because this game is that good. Everything feels like it matters. Hiring mercenaries makes you feel powerful. Getting a simple upgrade like a plow even makes you feel so much more advanced as a kingdom. Putting your fields on the right stretch of terrain where the ground is rich enough for massive crop yields, which is a really cool feature, um, or putting the well in the right location so it's central to everything, but it's on underground water. I mean, stuff like this is really intricate and cool. Even the process by which buildings come together and visually take shape makes you feel like your society is advancing as the church comes together brick by brick, for example. And all of it in tandem leaves me with a profound sense of satisfaction every single time I play, because this game is just good flat out. It's the old fashioned kind of, I can't wait to log in and play it type feeling. And I'm gonna play it more after I finish this video. I'm gonna do a, an entire new run because it's incredibly fun. Overall, Manor Lords is an easy addition to the Indie Spotlight series, well deserving of that. High praise to Hooded Horse for helping make all of it possible. And I can't wait to see what else there is at the end of the month because this game is fantastic. That's it. If you want to support, there are links down below. Locals and Patreon, monthly memberships. Those are the best, obviously. Also a VPN deal, a special VPN deal if you want one of those and more, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching. Definitely check out Manor Lords. I'll put a Steam link in the description as well. It is very much worth your time and have a nice night.